Hi, this is Jesse Ferguson, folk musician and YouTube broadcaster. And today I'm bringing you an introduction to my homemade mountain dulcimer, Appalachian dulcimer. And this is a re-recording of my original introduction to the instrument. Um, I re-record it because now I have better recording equipment and because I've made several modifications to the instrument and because I hope to address a number of questions about how to make the instrument, how to play it and so on uh, that have been posed to me since the, the first video. So, the instrument is the only stringed instrument native to North America, as far as I know. It originated in the early 19th century in the Appalachian region of the USA and was popular among the Scottish and Irish immigrants there. So again, it lends itself to my musical interests, which are Scottish and Irish traditional folk music. Um, and my instrument has a simple straight box for the resonator box. Now, the modern Appalachian dulcimer has typically an hourglass shape or sometimes a teardrop shape. So don't be confused, it's the same instrument with a different, different shaped resonator box. And because it has this simple box shape, it bears some similarity to the Tennessee music box, which is also a dulcimer-like instrument. I'm not sure if it's actually just a dulcimer from that region. Um, a very simple instrument, string instrument from the Tennessee region. And also to cigar box instruments, um, cigar box dulcimers, banjos, guitars, etc. Um, and the operative part there is that the resonator box is easy to make or easy to find in the case of finding a tin or a, a cigar box to provide the resonator. That's one of the main reasons why I was attracted to make one of these instruments is the ease of manufacture. I have some experience with, with woodworking. My father was a cabinet maker and uh, so I had access to his tools and his know-how, but I didn't have advanced knowledge to bend wood or to shape wood in complex ways and so on. So a straight box is about the simplest thing you can make, the simplest instrument resonator box. And so very simple to do. You could do an exact version of this instrument with cigar boxes or you know some kind of tin, cookie tin, underneath as well. So worth bearing in mind. Now, materials are, 1 8 inch plywood with uh, oak veneer on it for the sides and the box. The fretboard is solid oak, about two and a half inches wide by what, three quarters? Three quarters of an inch. Um, the tailpiece and the bridge are two separate pieces actually of purple heartwood and so is the nut, an exotic hardwood. The pegs to hold the strings are simply screws, in this case Robertson head screws. And how I attach the strings there is just uh, guitar strings is, are what I use, and they come with a brass loop. So I just take the free end of the string, pass it through that, that brass bead, and make a sort of a, a snare out of it, and I snare one of the screw heads with it. And uh, it's a good piece of advice to drill pilot holes in that tailpiece for those screws because otherwise you can split the wood. It's under a fair bit of tension due to the strings. Those are just glued on. The fretboard is just glued in place. There are no screws, just uh, wood glue there. Um, same thing with the nut, just wood glue. The tuning bit is, uh, the tuning bits are machine heads, just straight machine heads from the guitar not very expensive. I went to my local music shop and asked for the most inexpensive machine heads that they they had. I had to buy a pack of six because they're for, guitar, for guitars, but you could always, you know, recycle some off of an old instrument, an old banjo, something like that. I did have to grind the back plates a little bit to make them fit in a two and a half inch wide headstock, so I ground the plates with a Dremel tool to make them fit on there. And one of the modifications that I've done since my first video on this instrument is to grind the two first machine heads down. I cut them off actually first and then ground them with the Dremel tool. And the idea was to make the whole instrument just a little bit more compact, a little more portable. And that's the reason why I cut off the decorative headstock that I used to have on here, which had a piece of purple heart on it, meant to look like the bloom of a thistle. 
to pick up the theme from the sound holes. So I cut that off and trimmed the, uh, the first two machine heads and to make it a little bit more portable. Sometimes I throw this instrument in my book bag if I'm, say, going to read at the park, something like that. And having that piece up on top with the, the two points on it, like the thistle bloom, and the extra, extra tall machine heads just made it snag on things a bit more than I wanted it to. So the sound holes are thistle shaped to pick up on my Scottish heritage and my interest in Scottish folk music, and also the roots of the Appalachian dulcimer, Scottish and Irish uh, folk music and immigrants bringing their, their songs over. Um, I cut those out with a scroll saw, power tool. Now, the original plans for this instrument just had round sound holes. I will show a close-up of these details before. The book that I got these instructions from, I can't remember the name of it, it was a fairly old book from the 60s, and it had various instruments to make, fairly simple. Now I modified this, these blueprints a fair bit. They had a three-string dulcimer, and uh, I made that a four-string, and so on and so forth. I modified some of the, 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 the dimensions as well. But I will show a close-up of these instructions, which should answer a lot of questions that uh, may arise. Now, the other modification I did since I first made this was to use a glossy varnish. I took the whole instrument apart and glossy varnished the whole thing, which makes it uh, show scratches a lot less. But the other, the other consideration there is that if you like to play your dulcimer on your lap, which is how I typically do it, that glossy varnish makes it slide around on my jeans a fair bit, um, which is not good. You want the instrument to be fairly stable on your lap. If you're playing it on a table, I don't think it would matter as much. Now the frets are made from jumbo paper clips. And uh, the advantage there is that they're cheap, they're straight, and they're corrosion resistant. So what I did is I took wire snippers and I snipped up at the top and the bottom and got a good piece of straight rust resistant wire from each of them. And what I did was I left that a little bit longer than I needed to to cover the span of my fingerboard. And the reason for that is I'll tell, I'll tell you right now, is to determine how far the, the frets should be from each other is fairly complex. It can be complex. I did it in a simple way. Um, they do give you some guidelines in this booklet, but those are only good if your the length of your the, the vibration of your string the the length of your vibrating string the vibrating portion that is inside the nut and inside the bridge has to be exactly what they put down there, which is unlikely to be the case, especially if you're an inexperienced woodworker. So there are some some formulas you can use on the internet where you punch in the length of your fretboard and it will tell you where to put the frets. Um, but what I did is I started down at this end of the neck and I worked my way up one fret at a time using a digital tuner from my guitar. So what I did is I took that piece of fret wire, paper clip wire, and I taped it with masking tape top and bottom on the fretboard and I slid it to the point where I thought it should be based on the sound of it. And then I use the tuner to say, okay, that's a little bit flat, I'll move it up exactly where it should be to produce that note. I taped it there, used a pencil on either side to mark where it should go, removed that piece of wire, filed a groove with a, a file, and then crazy glued that fret down. Then I just moved up the neck to the next one, and so on and so on, all the way up the neck. Now the traditional Appalachian dulcimer is chromatic meaning it's do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, with no semitones in between. Whereas a guitar, you won't have long spans like this one where there's no fret. So what that means is you can't play complex melodies that have sharps or flats or seventh notes, um, or blues notes as they're sometimes called. Believe me, I'm, I'm no music theorist, I don't know a lot about music theory. Um, but very complicated notes, you can't play classical music on an Appalachian dulcimer, not in the traditional configuration. Now you can always add another fret on to yours if you want to. You can make it fully, uh, fully chromatic. Um, uh, at any rate, you can, you can allow it to play more complex melodies if you want to. It won't be as traditional and it might be harder for you to arrange the, the frets that way, but it certainly is possible. Um, 
So that worked fairly well, crazy glued them. And then once they were all in position in the right place, I used a Dremel tool to round the edges so that they weren't sharp anymore. As I said, I made them a little bit longer than they need to be at first. And then I, sh I filed them to make them soft uh, so that they wouldn't snag. So the other bit to consider is that there's a cutout here, as you can see, for your finger, for your plectrum, your pick as we call it nowadays. Now the traditional way would be to use a goose quill, a goose uh, or a turkey feather for the plectrum. I just use a nylon pick. I tried it with a feather and it was a bit messy, leaving debris, and it wasn't very loud. If you want it to be loud, I, I suggest playing with a soft nylon pick. And you play right there. Now the traditional way to play is with, I'm, I'm basing this traditional information off of the, uh, the information in that book that I used, is to use what they call a noter, which is just a dowel. You can try it with, with a pencil before you run out and buy a dowel, um, because I don't like playing with it with the noter. Um, I find it slow. And the way you would play it is you would play up and down the neck with your finger judging the distance. You're only touching that first series of strings, the 2D two high D's and you slide that up and down and that the other two strings this D and that A just ring out like drones like bagpipe drones so I'll let you hear what that sounds like I don't play this way so that's not my uh, my best playing style So it works out alright. The thing is you're limited by the speed of your wrist that way, whereas if you use at least two fingers, you can do sort of tremolo effects or you know move more quickly between notes. So the way I do it typically is I play with these three fingers. If I'm doing a large span, I'll play with my thumb and then my, my middle finger. If I'm doing something uh, not quite so demanding melodically up and down the neck, then I usually use my middle finger and my thumb or just these two fingers. to play that same melody I played before. So, I'm not a, I'm not a magician with the instrument by any means, um, but I do enjoy playing it. I usually play it on my lap, which changes the angle a little bit too. So you can play chords, again, they wouldn't necessarily be chords in every instance because if you just ring open, it's not a chord either, technically. But you can create chords, usually with two fingers. So this would be D, then add two fingers, G, D, and then A. So you can play most folk songs, most traditional folk songs with just those three chords. If you add the minor, which I believe is the B minor, you can play you know, thousands more. So really, as for simple folk music, it's a great instrument to just pick up and start playing right away. Again, you can get charts of chords off of the uh, off of the internet for different um, for different tunings. So I believe that's all I have to say about that. My next video will show me playing a song on this. That melody I played was called the Four Marys, a traditional Scottish melody. And that's the song I will play next time. So you'll get a better, a better chance to hear me play that and perhaps see the, the actual um, movement of my fingers and so on on the, on the fretboard. So I hope you liked it. And I hope if you make an instrument of your own based on this, on this technique, and again, there will be tutorials of how to make it on the internet and so on. I think it's a great instrument to get started with. And if you play guitar or banjo or mandolin already, you'll pick up this instrument no problem. It's very, very intuitive. And if you play, you know, in, a, in the major chord in that key, there's, there's no wrong note you can hit. You can just play around with it, improvising and so on. It's really fun that way. So right now I'll show you a close up of these instructions. At any moment. See, there's the image of their version with the dowel and the quill. 
Here's the materials list. Hopefully you can make this out. As you can see, I modified the dimensions of the fingerboard from one, one and one quarter to one and a half inches. I don't own copyright to this. I would give credit if I knew what book it was, but if anybody knows what book it is, feel free to jump in. And last, Alright folks, happy building.